Hello everybody and welcome back to the Creating a Virtual World series. This is part two where we're going to be covering the client to server communication. Um, this is probably going to be the last video in the series that's completely slideshow based. Uh, I know it kind of sucks that we haven't jumped into you know hands-on building the virtual world yet but I want to cover some of the infrastructure and stuff like that first so that it, we end up with a more maintainable code base. So let's talk about the networking because that's very important. So first we need to know what types of actions need to be relayed between the client and the server. So one important one is movement. So when I talk about movement, I'm talking about like walking or spawning in a new room or anything like that. Um, these actions need to be relayed to the server so that it can draw your character on other people's machines, right? Because it's multiplayer. We're also going to need to communicate messages. So text-based messages, emotes, and if you want to have like a more permanent mail system so that it persists across log offs and stuff like that, um, then we'll, we'll need to handle that. And login will be incredibly important. So like authentication, connection, and we're also going to want to send like an online status to other players, especially to if we want to have like a friends list, then we want to know, let, you know, your friends, your, your players, friends know that that player is online. And that brings us to the buddy or friend management system. So we're going to need to be able to communicate, you know, if somebody gets added or deleted or blocked, anything like that will happen through this buddy system. And mini games. Uh, so a lot of virtual worlds will have little mini games, Galaga or something like that. Um, not too complex, but those will definitely need relaying between the client and server. And those will be quite complex, so we'll be covering those much later on in the series. And home management stuff. I would like to add the functionality for our players to be able to have their own little home that they can invite friends into and stuff like that. So we will cover that later on in the series as well. So first we should talk about the protocol, the lower level of networking. So the two most common protocols are TCP and UDP. You've probably heard of them. They work over IP. And TCP is a little bit slower, but it's a lot more reliable because it has error checking and it has um, packet drop checking. So if packets are dropped, they're resent, right? So every time a packet is sent, the the other connection will basically say, hey, I received this packet. And if it doesn't, then it will resend the packet. Um, UDP doesn't have this. So it's a little bit faster because there's less overhead, but it's less reliable. There's no error checking and packet loss is entirely possible. TCP is easier to work with, especially if you're newer to networking. And honestly, I don't have a ton of experience in networking. Um, and I'm going to assume that those watching this video don't have a, a, a great experience in networking. If you do, that's perfect, and you can implement this however you want, but um, I'm going to keep it to TCP because it's just easier to work with. And networking efficiency won't be as much of an issue in a game like the one we're making because there won't be, you know, thousands, well, not thousands, but like hundreds of packets going between different many different things at once like you would have in something like an FPS our virtual world's going to be a little bit less networking heavy so it's not incredibly important so like i said we'll use TCP it's just easier so let's talk about packet structure so we're going to be building our own packet structure on top of TCP by grouping packets together of similar functions networking and the code base will be more maintainable so not only is it good organization to organize packets based on their function, but it's also easier to add new packets without colliding with ones you've already added. So if you're adding a packet that's related to messaging um, that, that has nothing to do with minigames, then by grouping it that way, you're, you're avoiding a possible collision of, of um, identification. And... And we'll want to maintain a constant structure for the packets, right? It just helps avoid spaghetti code. The client and the server will parse it the same way, and it helps avoid confusion. So we'll have two main packet types, client request packets and server response packets, which I like to abbreviate as CRPs and SRPs. By the way, just a side note, these aren't really official terms. These are just ones that I'm using for the system that we're going to build for this virtual world. And the reason I'm doing this is it helps distinguish between messages that are sent by the client and messages that are sent by the server. And this is going to help for like when we're debugging and stuff like that. It's just easier 
to it's like quicker to see which one's the source and which one's the destination and we will also have an initial or prefix uh, which will note the packets group so here's going to be the general packet structure and parsing will also be very simplistic uh, I forgot to mention that we'll do text based rather than binary based the reason for this is rem remember we have to parse on both the client and the server side so the simpler we keep it the easier it'll be to maintain so the generic packet structure will be this so you can see that the percent sign is used as like a delimiter or a separator and each field has a specific purpose. So the first field will be if the client is sending the packet or if the server is sending a packet. So it will either be literally SRP or CRP depending on who's sending it. The second field is the type and this will be like a short initial which is noting the type of packet. This is what I was talking about earlier with grouping the packets by functionality. The third field will be the user's ID and this will be used to tag the action. For example, if we had like a movement packet that was sent to our client for another user, but we don't know which user moved, that doesn't really help us, right? Because the client's going to need to be able to redraw that player's location. And if we don't know which player it is, it's going to cause confusion. So each packet will have a user ID to help keep track of what that packet is specific to. And data will be the final field, and that'll be packet specific. That really depends on the handler for that type of packet. So packet types... We're going to cover these more in depth when we get into specific components later on in the series, but we'll go over some of the basic ones. And keep in mind that this system can be, more can be added to it later. So the first packet we have is the E packet type, and this is used for error communication. I think like if a user goes to log in and the password is incorrect, we could use an E packet to communicate that. An L packet will be used for authentication, and this is all for login related stuff. An A packet will be used for actions and by extension movement. Think of like walking, dancing, any action like that. The I packet will be used for items. So adding, removing, using items. Think like clothes and if we want to do player cards, backgrounds and stuff like that for that, that's all going to be handled by the I initial. The M packet will be used for messages. So these can be used for text-based messages, emotes, stuff like that. The F packet will be used for friend management, so if we're adding friends, removing friends, or we will also use it for blocking people, we'll have a blocking functionality. So anything like that will go under the F packet group. The MG packet group will be used for minigames. Now I'm thinking later on when we add minigames, because usually you're going to have more than one, we may add a suffix onto that initial denoting what minigame it is specifically, that way we can group even more tightly, um, just to help with organization and later on in the series we will get into home management so users players will be able to have their own little home that people can come into so home management packets will be used for like adding furniture and stuff like that to the player's house and we're going to have a p packet as well for ping and this is going to be used for a heartbeat packet which i'll talk a bit more about in a second so here's some examples. So we have a movement packet going from client to server. So you can see percent CRP percent A percent because it's A means it's a and it's an action. And we have one. So I'm just pretending like the player that you're playing as, for example, is user ID one. And then we see five comma zero. So this basically says that the player one, which is you, moved up the screen by five units, right? Or sorry move to the right by five units because we'll do it X and Y because it's 2D. A movement packet from the server, however, will have an SRP prefix, same A group, but it'll have user ID two. So this is another player that's moving and you can see one and seven. So that's that's the, the delta position, right? That's gonna be the change. A message packet you can see has the M type and the text content of the message is literally right in the data section and the server to client looks very similar except it's an SRP and the user ID is 2. So let's talk about the ping or the heartbeat packet. So sometimes player connections will drop unexpectedly. Think if somebody closes their browser without logging out, they have a power outage or they shut down their PC. We really don't want to waste time communicating with dropped players because it wastes bandwidth and it wastes resources. There's no reason to do it. So the server will check for players that are disconnected by sending them heartbeat packets. So basically heartbeats will be sent to each player at five second intervals and 
if the player fails to respond to this heartbeat, then they're just disconnected, and the server basically considers them dead until they re-authenticate. So here's a bit of an example. So the server sends a ping packet to the client. The client sends a pong packet back, and uh, and we know that the server, the connection is good. So just as a bit of a summary, packets will follow specific standard structure, which is easy to parse, which we've already talked a bit about using the percent signs. And packets will have a field noting whether the packet came from the client or the server. So we decided to do this by checking if it's a CRP or an SRP. And the packet type and user ID are required for all packets. Type for grouping similar packets together and the user ID for tagging that packet to that user. And we should block all packets not related to authentication for users that aren't logged in. So for example, if a user hasn't logged in, they shouldn't be able to send action packets to be able to move around because they're not even in the game. So that's something we're going to need to handle on the server side. Another thing that we probably want to do is make it so that um, players can't forge other players. So players can't send packets with different IDs in them, right? So that's going to be tied with the authentication. So um, yeah, that's another thing that we'll handle server side it. And packet types and data structures should be documented for maintainability. So there should be like a Word document or something like that, anything really, that just documents what each type is for and the structures for the data for those types of packets. And it just makes the code more maintainable and if some other developer comes on later on or something, they'll be able to quickly come up to speed on how the networking is laid out. And this is why we're doing this video first before we're jumping into setting up the server. So in the next part, we'll cover version control. We're gonna use Git. So in the next part, we'll set up this version control. Uh, we'll create a GitLab private repository and we'll talk about some basic Git commands. And, uh, and then after that, we'll be ready to start working on the site and, and get working on the game. And I will see you guys in part three.